No. <laughs> Donald, because she couldn't, uh, you know. Couldn't have the D. She, she, well, the D is how she, she got him. <laughs> I walked right into that one. <laughs> hey, guys. Welcome uh, to our podcast. This is our first episode, Cracking Spines. Tell all your friends. Otherwise, you guys are horrible people, and we don't like you. I'm here with Candace because nobody else would do this with me, and I guess like she's last resort, so it's like whatever. But um, that's a nice way to say hostage. <laughs> you know, what's the word? <laughs> <laughs> what is the name? Let's let's talk Shakespeare. <laughs> let's talk about that plagiarizer. <laughs> oh, that's a whole month by itself. Oh yeah. Um, I was also thinking about doing a month for Stephen King, maybe like whatever his birthday is, like mm. whatever month his birthday is, uh, doing one for Stephen because he has such a range. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Stephen King, so if you guys are uh, aware, if you guys haven't caught the live streams, we are going to be reading um, All the Ugly and Wonderful Things uh, by Bryn Greenwood. It's B-R-Y-N Greenwood. Uh, this is the book we're discussing today. So if you haven't read it, it's okay. Um, there is going to be some spoiler alerts, or as we call it, foreshadowing. <laughs> so learn. Um, second, uh, the next book we'll be doing, which will air on the 19th, will be Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. And then to cap off the rest of February, we're going to be reading Misery by Stephen King, and that will air on the 26th. So be sure to get your books. And then um, on the 26th, we'll give you guys a heads up of what what books will be going over. Also, you can find all the books uh, on our Instagram. I will give you guys all the Instagram information. I'll give you guys a little bit later on. Try to put out a reading list at the beginning of the month so you guys can read at your leisure. Very that. So should we get into all the ugly and wonderful things? <laughs> That's one way to put it. I mean, it's. Buckle up, I wouldn't everybody. say it's appropriately titled because I didn't see where the wonderful was, but uh, did you catch the, the line where they actually say the title in the book? I did. I flagged it. <laughs> This golden one right here is where was they it said on, like, it. Was it on 221? It was on close-ish. 298. Okay. Like, I was in the right ballpark area. Mm-hmm. I'm like, usually, okay, if you, you guys can't see it now, and we will have video in the future, but right? And photos. And photos. Um, But, like, we, as lit majors, tend to use these little stick things. We can give you guys a little list of things that you can use. I will put it up on the Instagram um, or the Twitter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we like to flag a lot of different areas where we can talk about um, different symbols and themes and, like, uh, uh, story structure stuff in the book. And so, uh, yeah, her book is just full of them right now. Yeah. I was out this this book though when I read it I was taking notes and I was in it for the first like couple chapters and uh, I was underlining things and uh, dog earing uh, the pages and then I realized quickly that I was remembering every single detail of this book as if I just watched a movie so what mm -hmm. I will give Bryn the only credit I'm going to give Bryn right now is um, her ability to tell a story because yes. I, I think the subject matter choice is questionable she's a good writer she's it's a, a great compelling writer story it flies and for everybody who's listening who read the book you probably had a similar experience that like it you're was drawn quick. in and and you read it and i was talking to my husband about it he was like you seem to love this book and hate this book what is it is it a good book or a bad book and i'm like it's not that black and white this it's is a push really, and pull for sure it's a really great book to talk about because from like a story standpoint like if you watch the movie you'd be like i'm probably not going to watch that movie a second time yeah, and but she's a good a good writer. Like like the movie I'd Mother. Read an, like, like, I, yeah, I'd read another one of her books just because I'm like, well, I know I can read her shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that's an easy. It's an easy read. Like I was yeah. flying through it, man. I was flying through the pages. Right. <laughs> I think my favorite part in the notes that I've taken was where I'm like, of course his name is Bill. Fucking, and of course he's a dick. <laughs> and then later on, I'm like, oh, there's Bill, still a dick. <laughs> <laughs> like every time he makes an appearance, he's just a fucking douchebag. Oh, for sure. But going back to what you were saying, I think we should have a, at some point for you guys, we'll have a Posted secondary, we'll, but we'll also have an episode where maybe we dive into the different ways in which we read books, where we, how we flag them, uh, how we highlight them. And it, for me, it's different. I mean, I'll probably do a different system for Geek Love. It just, as you get into it. So we, yeah, can, we you, can talk about how we, I, I, how we read. You would book. think <laughs> with how organized we are with the books and thoughts and um, the textual evidence, uh, you would think that our system is very organized. It's chaotic. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to us. Oh, for sure. But like if I picked up her book and I'm like, what the fuck is your system? Like, well, and she picked up mine. She'd be like, do you have one? <laughs> and next week I'll bring in geek love and it'll look nothing like this. Yeah. So. <laughs> have, I have actually, um, not running out of tabs. I have torn a page 
like torn a little corner on the page so I could. I ran out of colors for this one. And again, you'll see the picture. <laughs> Reference the Instagram photo as I'm saying this. But I got six colors in and I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to need to find another way to flag this motif. Yeah, we're going to have neons, <laughs> pastels, royals. <laughs> so this motif will go at the top of the page. <laughs> so. Oh, man. Okay, so figured we would start with. Yes. <laughs> Um, the beautiful you, description. You guys are going to get um, video um, of us. We'll probably post it up on the YouTube when the YouTube comes. Uh, as we figure out how to get all of this online, uh, you guys are hearing it now, so it's there. Uh, if anything, we will make sure it's posted up on YouTube mm-hmm. where you guys can listen to it. I'm trying to avoid any way that you guys have to pay to access it because I feel like people should pay us for you to access it because we'll exploit the corporations. We won't let them exploit us. <laughs> Kidding, corporations. You didn't mean that, sponsors. Winks. Um, (laughs) Yeah, so you'll see um, how we go about picking these books. This month, being February, we were like, oh, it's it's the month of love. It's also Black History Month, but for us to talk about these books the way we plan on talking about these books uh, about Black authors during Black History Month would be extremely disrespectful to them. There's... like some people would probably get the the roast and the jokes and all that, um, but others would be offended. And we just don't feel like appeasing one uh, set of people from any community and offending the others. Like it's not worth it to uh, step on those toes. Not our place. Not our place. But um, what we we do is when we sat down for this month, we were talking about love stories. And we're not the type of people to do traditional love stories. Yeah, we, we don't. We immediately went, well, we can't do that. Yeah, we're like, well, single people are going to be annoyed. And then married people are going to be like, that's not how that happens. Bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> no, I think the fuck not. Let's yeah. not, like, go down that road. Yep. So from there, we were like, okay, well, let's think of something that's a little bit more, like, effed up, like spousal murder or something. Because... Um, that's more realistic. And <laughs> we both were like Gone, Gone Girl, Girl. <laughs> immediately. We both bought <laughs> the same book. And then so we started looking for books related to Gone Girl on Goodreads. Right. And like she had this like website or something. And then we started reading um, out the descriptions and taking turns reading them to each other, <laughs> looking for that response. And we knew what we were looking for in what we were reading, but also what the other person, how they were going to react. Like, I mean, I have notes on the process itself. And which may become a very loose way in which we do this podcast because the the reactionary nature of us is going to be very entertaining and so, that's why we chose this book <laughs> yeah there's probably a list of like six different books here and <laughs> all the ugly and wonderful things got uh, a heart and star next to it and then um <laughs> geek love got three stars so i know. think we even crossed one out when we found this we're like oh yeah we got we gotta start there oh yeah we did cross one out <laughs> which which one did not make the cut oh the couple next door yeah like, that didn't make the cut. I mean, it seemed interesting, but it's not really, like, on brand. Yeah. You're about to find out why this one shot to number one. <laughs> All right. All the ugly and wonderful things. A beautiful and provocative love story between two unlikely people and the hard-won relationship that elevates them above the Midwestern meth lab backdrop of their lives. I mean, first of all, let's, let's pause right there. Who wrote this description? Mm. And are they being investigated? Because mm. that's... Continue. Okay. The meth lab backdrop. I mean, I was hooked right there. <laughs> I was like, I can't get any more fucked up. My only problem with the meth lab, um, I'm going to say this now because I have to say it. Uh, Bryn missed a really good opportunity, right? She could have <laughs> named the main character Crystal. Mm. She could have named her Methany. Methany. Because I'm telling you, a tweaker would do that. Oh, yeah. All right. As the daughter of a drug dealer, Wavy knows not to trust people, not even her own parents. It's safer to keep her mouth shut and stay out of sight. Struggling to raise her little brother, Donald, eight-year-old Wavy is the only responsible adult around. Obsessed with constellations, she finds peace in the starry night sky above the fields behind her house until one night. Her stargazing causes an accident. After witnessing his motorcycle wreck, she forms an unusual friendship with one of her father's thugs, Kellen, a tattooed ex with a heart of gold. Okay. Um. No. (laughs) Absolutely not. That's what drew us in. And we're like, okay, this sounds sounds interesting. Did we know? Spoiler alert. Did we know it was going to be like a 19-year-old falling in love with an 8-year-old? No. Um, Did we hope it was not going to be that? Sure. Hoped, yeah, yeah. We felt like we were hoping really it was going to be more of a, like a imprinting situation kind of via Twilight, <laughs> you know, or <laughs> like they love each other, but it's like a different kind of love. Nope. 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 
She liked the smell of his hair. Referencing the first line, a beautiful and provocative love story. Uh, that's actually on the cover. Right under New York Times bestseller. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on, America? <laughs> I, bet, I bet this is the one book that the Republicans were reading. At least Matt Gates did. Or Bryn bought like 10,000 copies. <laughs> there would be a little, um, that little cross, with that, is that thing called? Next to their name on. So if you guys are ever reading the New York Times list, uh, if there's a little cross like it, it looks like a little dagger cross thing next to their listing. It means uh, uh, lots of books. Like when I mean lots, I mean like a lot, which is hundreds of books at one time are purchased by one purchaser, usually to give out at a conference or usually to give to trade shows, trade shows, mm-hmm. things like that. That's signifying that, yeah, they're on the bestseller list, but they're on the bestseller list. There were like groups of these books bought, but mm-hmm. um, I didn't see that with her. <laughs> um, I do want to... A beautiful and provocative, this is the back, a beautiful provocative love story between two unlikely people and the hard-won relationship that elevates them above the Midwestern meth lab. Were they ever really elevated above that? Because I feel like, I mean, she made it into college, but she was like a little genius. You know what I mean? Like, So let's get into the story of this. For for those that are following along and and didn't read the book, but you're just here to listen to us talk about it. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of that awkward conversation where it's this almost feels like sitting down to have the talk with yeah. your kids or something or with your parents. Your parents are about to have the talk with you. Like, right. That's what it feels like. So for those of you that just heard that description and you're like, they didn't they didn't become like a couple, right? Yes. Oh, it's worse. Yes. It's worse. It's worse than becoming a couple. As much as he tried not to have things happen, they happen. Mm-hmm. Very graphically. <laughs> Very graphically. But I will say this. There is like... A, the whole time you're like, this entire situation is wrong. Like, this is grooming. It's not a relationship. It's grooming. It's grooming. It's absolute grooming. And like, they're like, oh, you know, people have, I was reading some like people's arguments online. They're like, oh, well, when she was an adult and da-da. she was groomed to become the adult that like, anyway. Yeah. I mean, by the time she hits what, 12, 13, she's pretty much naked every time they're hanging out together. Yeah. I mean, it. it's. And he's like cupping her breasts. Yes. And like tweaking her nipples. It's, um unnecessary unnecessary you could just say there was some contact this is definitely not a young adult book no where they like signify that something sexual is going to happen and then they like come back to this the the timeline of their love story is really fucked up i mean they did it have to start at eight that's my question did she have to be eight when it started couldn't it could be just as bad at 11 i know it's like i feel like it's when they put like a rape scene in a movie like um the hills have eyes Mm -hmm. like it was completely unnecessary it was just there for shock value yeah and I'm like, who am I to censor a book? A Christian? Couldn't they have like met and, I mean, <laughs> is there is there a great way to do grooming? I don't think there's like, like I would or, prefer him to groom her this way, but it's just well, like from I, the minute they met, I mean, his first. Was she an angel? Yes. That was my first like, what the fuck? Note in the. <laughs> and then her first thing is like, I smelled his hair and he smelled like gasoline and gravel or something. And I'm no, like. No, 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 <laughs> no. It was, he smelled sweet. He smelled amazing. The rest of him was sweat and gasoline and something delicious. Bacon. Oh, bacon. I mean, that, that I get like, who can't resist bacon? But it's just so- All you vegans out there. <laughs> I know you say you can, but you love the smell. Don't lie. I mean, it's just so heavy handed. She's eight years old. He crashes on the side of the road on his motorcycle. She runs up to him. The first thing out of his mouth is, are you real? Ugh. <sighs> Are you not an angel? I mean, it's, it's so from the moment he lays eyes on an eight-year-old. Weird. And she's, I mean, she's a good writer. I will go back to that. But it's heavy-handed. She He writes the phone number of who he wants her to call in, in blood. blood on her arm. And she's like, like, this is normal. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, this is normal. I'll just go make a phone call. I don't talk to anybody, but this will be the time I do it. I don't let anybody touch me, but sure, here's my arm. Like, she's not let a single person lay a finger on her. Like, she does not want to be touched. Like, she turns into a kung fu master when you try to touch her. Yeah. Like, she gets in a lot of trouble the, for it. The way you would expect an eight-year-old who's had the life that she's had to be. But he's like, here, give me your arm. And he's got a finger full of blood. And she's like, here you go. He's, like, passing out, like, trying yeah. to write this. And he's I like, are you an he- angel? And then he wanted to know if she was real. See, I could understand, like, if he just always saw her as, like, a little kid running around and was protective of her because he noticed nobody else was being protective of her. And then right. when she was, like, 18, 19, all of a sudden he realized he had, like, feelings for her because of one day. Right. She turned her head one certain way and he caught a whiff of her and that's what kicked it off. Like, that would 
would be more understanding of this like shocking and like provocative uh, love story because right. there's still that power dynamic there, right? And her developing an infatuation with him, would, I would get that. Yeah, if she, he's l- like a girls stable. Have, I mean, even at one point, they're like, when she's like, oh, he's my boyfriend, and da, 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 everybody's da. like, aw. And everyone hates her Aunt Brenda. And I'm like, she's the only one with any common sense around here. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. And Butch. And Butch. Oh, Butch. Like, okay, so there are moments in this book where you're going to like. You're going to you're going to agree with the relationship on accident. Like, yeah, I was there's a poker scene. The end of the poker scene. He says, Butch says, um, she was somebody else's little girl. Mm-hmm. And that's where it like because uh, I'm like laughing because she's like taking all these dudes for their money. because She's good at math. She's like going full rain man on them. And you're laughing with her and you're like, yeah. And you're like invested in this story of this like young girl dominating all these men that are being like misogynistic and like, oh, okay, little girl. And right. she takes them for thousands of dollars mm-hmm. and she's like cracking up about it. And you're like cracking up with her. And then you, you forget because like Callan's like proud of that moment. And all these people are like, okay, with this situation happening, math addicts, but like. At the end, Butch is like, that's somebody's little girl. Butch is the first one to throw up pedophile. Yeah. He's the first one to throw that out there. And I even wrote in the book, I'm like, somebody said it. But there's a scene where Butch kind of like gives himself over to the concept of the relationship because somebody says that about, um, somebody else says that to Kellen and Kellen grabs him by the throat. Right. And he's like, no, right. that's not what this, and this is before, uh, this is before the couch scene. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you guys heard that deep swallow, but it's, it's, uh, this, this one's rough. This, I mean, a reader discretion is advised. Yeah. So the progression of this, if you've already read it, sorry, I tried to make that clear the other day. (laughs) They both fall into an infatuation with each other. Yes. And it continues and it continues to where he's buying her an engagement ring when she's 13, 14 years Just to make her happy. Just to make her happy. Could have called it a promise ring, but no. Right. Even, no, even if, see, like, that's what you do. Could have called it, no. No. Can't even do that. <laughs> like, why are you, and it's an expensive one. Like, the lady was, like, not even going to say the price, or she's like, oh, there's some antique ones here. And and he's kissing her hand, kissing her head, and like you said, everybody, they're not hiding this. This is just this 13-year-old girl and this 25-year-old man. Yeah, and the, the concept of child bride comes in here, like, that's okay. Mm-hmm. <sighs> and so he eventually does go to jail for, yes. for statutory rape. Yeah, which she pines for him the entire time. And but here's the problem: like he didn't actually. Well, I mean, he did, but the the description of it isn't what happened. She was saying it for shock value right. and like showing that her as a child didn't really understand uh, the gravity and the nature of the situation. I don't think anybody ever explains to her once in the book. Hey, this is illegal, right? This is like, he's just, oh, this is wrong. This is bad. She's like, oh, I'm dirty. So one of the themes, it's like a constant running theme with her is how much her own mother like just fucked her up. Right. Her mother was not only a meth addict, but she had like clinical OCD, OCD. Yeah. to the point where she'll make them food and then halfway through them eating, like put her hands in their mouth, pulling the food out, saying this is dirty, get it out of your mouth. And it comes to a point where she ends up with like a, a fear of eating in front of other people. And uh, which she, never goes away. Never goes the away. The last page of the book, she's eating in secret in the kitchen. Out of the trash. Right. Like she. She's, she there's, eats out of the trash. Never this this provocative love story did not help. <laughs> like that did not get healed. Yeah, that is, that is I mean, Kellen there. did help her in the sense that he would just close his eyes so she would eat. But like, why uh, is it that the pedophile is figuring? I mean, well, that makes sense. It's like his whole thing is to study her. But uh, yeah, the thirty containers of ice cream he has in his freezer for her. I mean, yeah, yeah. Th- thirty one because you know all the flavors. <laughs> it's like, and they're like, it's so sweet. <sighs> Yeah. Ice cream is a romantic if ice cream is a romantic gesture in your fucking relationship, right to jail. Straight to jail. <laughs> well, when it's a 13-year-old kid. Oh my god, her the boobs barely have developed, you mm-hmm. know? Like, okay. okay. So she starts out um 5 years old is the beginning of the book. Mm-hmm. 5 years old. Like uh like uh, the I love the first page. I want to read you guys the first page. My mother always started this story by saying, this is her cousin telling this portion every every chapter is labeled a different character in the book which i want to come back to by the yeah way. it's very game of thrones um <laughs> my mother always started this story by saying well she was born in the backseat of a stranger's car as though that explained why a wavy wasn't normal it seemed to me that could only happen that, that could happen to anybody maybe your parents on the way to the hospital your parents respectable middle class car middle class come on yeah <laughs> methodics uh broke down that was uh not what happened to wavy she was born in the backseat of a stranger's car because uncle liam and Aunt Val 
were homeless driving through Texas when their old beat up van broke down. Nine months pregnant, Aunt Val hitchhiked to the next town for help. If you ever consider playing Good Samaritan to a pregnant woman, think about cleaning that up. Ugh. Basically, like the but the first the and we're in it. Last sentence of the first <laughs> chapter is like leave a pregnant woman stranded. <laughs> Unless you, you unless know. you feel like cleaning that shit up, I'm sorry. Wasn't Liam there? I would have been like, yo, dude, like your wife, you need to clean this shit up. It's like your baby's bathwater, man. Come on, but like that's how it like starts out. And so like at five years old, she's uh, because her mom's in jail and her dad's probably in jail too. I think um, she ends up staying with her cousins and her aunt, and her aunt is just like heartbroken, trying to desperately plead with this child to figure out what's wrong. Um, her uncle Bill is a fucking dick the whole time. Oh, like, for sure. Keep sending her back. Get her out of here. I don't want to deal with it. Blah, 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 blah. Very like straight white man. You know, it's not my responsibility. And she's trying. And this child at five years old sneaks out every night to go steal food from the neighbors. Oh, she still like, thinks. And things. Like she has a little like. Little, little, a little kleptomania. Like she hides things. Like she steals things from one she house had a and little, hides them in the park. She and, even stole the little trunk that she kept everything in. Yeah. And she like, and this is how she does it. She gets in. By jimmying open the door at five, she's like a pick lock. Yeah. Or lock pick. Well, you know, whatever. But yeah, you're right. Both of her parents are in jail. And in jail, that's where mom has a little brother. Yeah. Donald. Because she couldn't, um, you know. Couldn't have the D. She, she, well, the D is how she, she got him. But... <laughs> I walked right into that one. <laughs> <laughs> she's just, uh, Donald. Donald. Donal? Like, I just, uh, oh. Doonal. I was just saying Donald in my head. I said Donald too. It spells Donald like, uh, I'm sorry, Bren, like you need to, like when you're going to have a weird, interesting name that nobody in the world has, right. um, you should probably like kind of hint to the person how it's said. But then she's like, you know, once she's reunited with them, like she's like, fuck, I need to protect Donald at all costs to keep him five years old. She's figuring out, wait a minute, hold on. Because right. uh, her mom has to go through a program and her mom starts out with the program. Then her mom gets pulled back into toxicity by um, Wavy's dad. By the way, the, the main character's name is Wavona. 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 Yeah. What? Like, where did that name come from? And, and then. Wavy's what she calls herself and she only admits that to Kellen, right? No, no, no. Kellen calls her Wavy. Oh, okay. And that's why she only goes by Wavy. Everybody else tried to call her Vonnie. Vonnie. That's what it was. And so yeah. she's like, I don't go by that. I go by Wavy. Like right. immediately, like he owned, he owned her. Yeah. From like, so oh, it's so gross. Where they meet and the story just takes off is she's eight. She's living on this meth compound. Yeah. In the middle of nowhere. There's a lab, a farmhouse and trailers. And trailers with all of Liam, dad, his, dad's harem. Yeah. Which is a, like five girlfriends. And this eight year old's caring for this two year old. Yeah. When this happens. And I think three year old. Is he three, three when, we, yeah. when we get into the yeah. the meat of no, the No, he was too. He was too. You're right. Yeah, because he wasn't she's, really got, talking she's got him like on her hip and then she like goes and hides him in a room upstairs every time she goes to school. Yeah. So that mom and dad can't like do anything. No, he has his own room. She puts him in his uh, crib. Donald pulled at my heartstrings this whole, that like his whole story just broke my this heart. This kid is as innocent as can be. As can be. She did a great job of keeping this kid innocent. And and the way and it's probably could be labeled under the hit heavy handed, but there are scenes where all of this just horrible shit's going on, and like Wavy's perspective is like she notes that she can hear him screaming upstairs, and somebody needs to go to him, or like when Kellen cleans up the house mm-hmm. while she's at school, it's like the kids in like three day old like diapers, and, diapers. He, and Kellen's like I'll clean, it. I'll, I'll change it, and that continued at least for myself. I don't know if any other readers have this experience. All the way to the end when they finally find him at 14 in juvie. I mean, like, start to finish, Donald is the most heartbreaking character in this entire book to me. Yeah, and, like, like the kid never had a chance. Never well, had a chance. Well, I mean, in the end, he gets a chance. But, like, who are his parental figures? His um, groomed adult daughter or adult sister mm-hmm. and uh, her pedo. Like, where was the judge on this? I, I felt like the judge, oh, you guys, I know we're bouncing around. We but, are like, bouncing all over the place. But, like, when you look at this book. I mean, oh, fucking Christ. Let's just go over some notes here, man. I started taking notes. So just the first three chapters. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are what... <laughs> uh, I, I regret saying this now that I've read the whole story. Uh, I said very much Shawshank meets Children of the Corn meets Trash Panda. I mean, it kind of tracks. <laughs> Page five. Yeah. Um, uh, family introduction, uh, their own personal sideshow. So like when she's introduced as the five-year-old to her siblings... They're not her siblings, but her, her cousins. cousins. They look at her like the four of us stood there in the entryway, staring, uh, staring. Mom, Leslie, and I at Wavy. Like 
they were so intrigued by her and she's just this like quiet little thing to the part point where uh people and teachers think she's special needs right. and she was put in a special needs class she's not talking and her grandmother like Foley was like, you, we all need to step up for this kid. And everybody failed mm-hmm. grandma. Everybody failed grandma. Like I saw what grandma was trying to do and right. everybody failed grandma. Right. And when it's finally starting to work and she's finally got some stability. Yeah. Grandma dies. Grandma dies of cancer. Right. And, uh, you know, Aunt Brenda is so sad and torn up by that. And Bill's like, no, fuck her. Send her off. No, that's the other thing. Going back to Bill, your favorite character. Oh, God, I hate him. I want to punch that guy in the throat. Val and Liam get out of jail and come for her, right? Yeah. And Brenda cannot be bothered to go, mm, maybe we should intervene. Maybe we should. Well, no, she tries to say something. Like, shouldn't she be further into her program before doing this? They, like, immediately out the gate, this program is supposed to, like, rehabilitate them while they have their children with them. And Bill is in her ear going, just let her take them. Just let her take them. Just let her. Like, Bill cannot be bothered to stop watching TV long enough. <laughs> like, he's always in his den. Like, he doesn't want to be interrupted. Like, his whole purpose in the book is just to push Brenda to just be like, just abandon her. Let Val take her and go. Yeah, I kept saying, like, uh, my first note around uh, Bill was typical boomer, <laughs> classic boomer, mad when they don't get their way. No, we won't. Dad stood up and blocked my view, so I'll never know what looked past between him and mom. But he went to the counter to pour himself more coffee. Mom nodded. Like, mm-hmm. mom it screamed and dad yelled. I'm like, fucking boomers. That's, mm-hmm. what I wrote next to it. <laughs> like, That's the other thing. The book takes place, what, 1970? She was born in 69, but it starts out in uh, March of 75. Right. Right, so the book takes place in the 80s, early 90s is where we end. Where again, going back to the sort of the timeline of this love story, she pines for him while he's in jail. When he's released, she's not allowed to see him. Thank God we have laws in place to where, like, no, it violates his parole if she goes to see him. She goes to the judge and pleads the case of please let us be together. After writing 3,000 kabillion letters, and then she goes to her, like, her college campus and, like, of course, Jimmy's open a door and steals all the books that she's not supposed to take with her. She put them back, but like she was like mine. Right. So in the in in the course of character development, we're right where we were in the beginning. She meets with the judge. And I mean, if you're holding the book in your hands, you've got 25 pages left. And you, the judge gives her that speech of like, no, I'm sorry. Like, you're not different than any other girl that comes in here wanting to see her abuser again. And I'm thinking, OK, like, maybe this- maybe this female judge, which, you know. I liked that, that it was a female judge yeah. that was like, look. But I feel like using the female judge was uh, a ploy to, to further justify this situation. That she gave in. Wavy doesn't even get home from the meeting before the judge has changed her mind. And it was like, you know what? Your love is real. Yeah. Be with him. And it's just like, does anyone, like, somebody stand up? She said, my family is, like, your family your is family's real. real. She was like, hey, let me manipulate you real quick. <gasps> like, so when it comes to, like, the whole uh, Val situation, Aunt Val is uh, Wavy's mom. Right. Brenda's sister, Val. She's the younger sister. Um, and she was always the problem. In and out of trouble. In and out of trouble. And here it says, Valerie got paroled, and I hired a light. Okay, so the second time was right before, okay. She lived with, with me for almost two years, and in that same time, she touched me twice on what would have been herbs and my 14th anniversary mm-hmm. i had a little wine and got maudlin wavona touched my hand my wedding ring to comfort me i think the second time was right before valerie got paroled and i hired a lawyer to help her get custody of wavona and the baby she had while in prison my i underlined that my first note was how about she gets adjusted first right like <laughs> like and then it's for women with children to help her get back on her feet so she can take care of donald uh, you guys can't see that, but that's me rolling my eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, and Wavona, I knew that would cause a ruckus, and it did. Oop, that's what I wrote. Uh, she said that. <laughs> but, like, Uncle Bill pretended to. Before Mama came, he said, let's get this over with and get her out of our lives. But then he hugged her and said, you look great, Val. You need to visit more often. Of course, his name is Bill, and he's still a dick. I actually have an entire motif of secrecy within this family. When it's their perspective, they, they're justifying that they kept a secret, but they're angry that somebody kept a secret. And they're justifying that they kept a it's secret. It's very and much they're though, angry that they're. We don't talk about that in this exactly, family. Exactly. Until it was like convenient. When, it's when, the issue ignored until they can benefit from it. Right. So when Brenda, Aunt Brenda, finds out from Amy and Leslie, her cousins, that Wavy's been having some sort of sexual First of all, it was Leslie opening her mouth and like ratting her out, like which, catty, by the way, good job, Leslie. <laughs> Like, good for you. Yeah. You know, and when she's like sitting there telling everybody this, I'm like, he's getting rolled. 
Yeah. Like I, that was like the most joyous moment for me is when Wavy sitting there telling all the girls and bragging about her relationship with him. I was like, homeboy is going to get rolled. Telling and them he about it starts, in like graphic, graphic. I mean, she lied about the graphic detail, but like it's because she's like found his like nudie magazines, which he was like, you shouldn't be looking at this. What are you doing? Like, so you had those moments with him where you're like, okay, like he's really concerned. He, this for him is like, this why is, is this, why is this happening to right. me? Why do I feel this way? Because we can't control how we feel, mm -hmm. but we can't control what we do with those feelings. And mm -hmm. I think like, I think that people also forget this. He's like 19 to 24 in the height of all this happening, um, which there's no justification there. His brain's not exactly fully developed, but he still knows right from wrong. You know what I mean? The frontal cortex isn't fully like there, right. but like he still knows right from wrong. And he's like arguing with himself and he's like pleading with himself at the same time, which is where I'm like, dude. Right. He's trying to. To justify to himself, but also at the same time, like, have the strength to do the right thing. And, and he's, he wants to pull himself out of the situation constantly, but he won't allow himself to pull himself out. Like, mm -hmm. he fights with himself. It's mm -hmm. it's this really push-pull with inside Kellen, which is his name. But, mm -hmm. well, his name is, what was it? Jesse, James, James, Jesse, Bear Jesse Joe Kellen, right? Jesse Joe Barfoot, Barefoot? Barfoot. Barfoot. Right. Was his, like, name. He's, Kellen, uh, Kellen is mom's maiden name. Yeah, his grandmother's. Maiden name. Is that what it was? Yeah, he took his grandmother's name. Okay. Uh, so Kellen is actually native indigenous and he's this big burly guy. That, Huge. Like that <laughs> just wreck people. Right. Um, also, uh, he's anatomically uh, proportionate, mm -hmm. um, which when you think about a 13 year old girl. And the size of her hand. And oh God, I didn't and think how, about it. how it was described in this book. It's it's heavy handed. I, it's not. No pun. Um, <laughs> it's not innuendo. And like, I was like, see, I don't remember. The, I remember this book like the back of my hand right now. And like, I don't remember that out? part. Because I was probably just like, my eyes just glazed over. Like, what am I reading? Like, why am I reading this? I, as a human adult man, mm -hmm. that's not even into women. Right. Let alone like little girls. Like the, the, the whole pedophilia thing is like lock every one of them up. Ugh, like when I read this, I felt so uncomfortable. Like what, dude, what are you doing? doing yeah i felt rage i like the mama bear steam coming out of my ears for half of this book was just like because that is a child and it is not yeah. written in innuendo it is not written in like flowery language like it's it's you're written there you are there for it's that. it's borderline smut and i say it's borderline because the whole book isn't like just smut like right. it's, it's the whole book is like about more of the relationship the push and pull and how they like are drawn to each other which Gross. Right. Gross. <laughs> like, but there's, there's a database of people who should not be allowed to buy this book. The one thing I do, <laughs> yeah, there is a, da a database. And he ends up on it at one point, in it. That's it's, how she finds him. But the, to your point, it's not smut, but it's also porn for the. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, w one thing that I will say about this is that it does force you to never really judge Wavy for her feelings towards him. Mm -hmm. It allows you to understand her as the victim rather than to blame her as the victim. Now, I'm sure there are some Joe Rogan fans out there that would be like, well, or, you know, um, some libertarians that would argue in favor of this relationship because, uh, you know, on brand. But uh, <laughs> you can't... I wasn't able to victim blame her. And yes, like, right. I'm a little bit social activist. I'm a lot of social activist, but still, like, there was never an inclination... For me to be like, what is she doing? Oh, because we met her at five. Yeah, you're you're like watching you, you. It's almost like watching this through a window and wanting to like, like I would be willing to knowing how dangerous Kellen is is to be choked by him to be hit by him and I would say in between each swing that he took, mm -hmm. like it's inappropriate. It doesn't matter how it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. You know it's inappropriate. Bam, get hit. Right. <laughs> like, well, and and for me, Wavy and Donald are spending weeks at a time. Fourth of July, Christmas at Brenda's. Like they don't leave Brenda's and never come back. They visit for vacation. She can see that these are not healthy children. Yeah, she before she clearly. knows that even Kellen exists. Yeah, but they get to that breaking point where Bill's like, "Come on, we need our life back. Like we need to get back into our routine." And they just—that is where I would just get enraged and be like, "I don't care how much it disrupts your life. Yeah, you can all. tell those two children need some mama bear to be like, nope, nope." And this is what makes you me mad. This is what now, makes me really mad about that situation was my sister and brother in law at one point were just like in a financial hardship. Mm -hmm. Not like not because they were doing anything wrong that put them there, just you know, living in California during the height of the recession was hard for them, right? Mm -hmm. Or the big I would say more towards the beginning of the recession, two thousand five ish. Mm -hmm. Um and so my 
nephews would stay with me right. constantly. Mm -hmm. And as a 20 year old, that should disrupt my life. But I was always like happy to do it. And like, it wasn't even a thought for me. So for me at 20 years old to be in that mindset and then to watch these boomers who, by the way, blame my generation for fucking everything, even though right. they're like you and your damn uh, participation trophies. I'm like, you gave them to us like you idiots. Like, uh, but to see these boomer, like this boomer character, just be like, fuck that. Get rid of this kid. And me at 20 being like, they need help. Let's help them. Right. Like, what's the alternative? Like, who are, like, who are, what adult sees a child losing their childhood and is like, you know what, let it happen mm -hmm. when you can fully step in and fix the problem. Right. Because if Brenda had said at any one of those visits, no, they're staying. You want them, Val? Come get them. Uh, I'm we gonna, know Val enough. <laughs> I'm going to say like, something cool. <laughs> uncontroversial yeah. and not so brave. Um, Brenda is the hero in the story, is the hero. Like, she was going to uh, his parole hearings and lying, saying, like, Wavy was traumatized, didn't want anything to do with him, right. understood everything right from wrong. Like, she did everything in her power to keep the groomer away from Wavy. Right. Everything in her power. Right. But in the end, she folds. She does. And she's doing it because she's making up for, because she's doing that after Bill divorces her. Yeah. And I am fully convinced that she goes full send in the last half of the book because she's making up for what a pushover she was letting those kids go. Yeah. That that's, she's making up for lost time. But I love that. She was like, yeah, bye to her husband. She's <laughs> like, yeah, no, this, like this could have been prevented by you not being such a dick. Seeing Val dead on the floor broke her. Like suddenly Brenda became a different character in this book. Very that. Very, very much so. Okay. So there's some questions in the back of the book. Oh yeah. You promised you didn't read. I swear on all that is atheist because like I don't believe in stuff. Um I guess that's the best way to say it. I swear I didn't and I even encouraged the readers. I encouraged you guys in my live to not read. If you did, it's fine. But like I wanted to go into this raw dog. She wanted me to go into this raw dog. Um I use the term raw dog for everything now, so get used to that. <laughs> Might be merch one day, who knows? Um reading books raw dog. RBR. RBR RBRD. <laughs> We'll, um, we'll table that one. Yeah. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, yeah. Oh, I think that it might be fun for us doing this with future books of mm -hmm. having the conversation as lit. I get to do geek love for you. Okay, for sure. But being able to circle back around and I'd like you to hear how Bryn talks about the book. So the question was asked of Ms. Greenwood. Your biography mentions that you're the daughter of a mostly reformed drug dealer yourself. How much of the story was inspired by your own childhood? I was thinking that the whole fucking time. I was like, who hurt you? Were you? <laughs> yeah. Like the whole time I was like, who hurt you? <laughs> like, I mean, bring Greenwood. Um, we are going to so... roast your shit. We love you as an author. Yes. Like but you're a great written... author. Um, it was written really well. It was <laughs> too well. Too well. All right. When I was a kid, my father was a meth dealer and he lived on an armed compound in the country. As a result of his career choices, I too witnessed a lot of wild things and met some unusual people. The other part of my life that I drew on heavily was my habit of getting involved with much older men, like Wavy at the age of 13, I fell in love with and dated a man twice my age. To an outsider, that relationship probably looked inappropriate. It was certainly illegal, but I have fond memories of my time with him. We had a loving, consensual romance that nurtured me a lot more than any of my adult relationships ever have. Okay, so here's the Let's thing. Let's unpack Let's unpack that. Uh, as a gay man, uh, when you're younger... Like you don't really have a lot of options. You can't just like fall in love at school, not in the nineties at least. Um, so you do seek out people where you can. And a lot of those times you will find someone that's 18, 19, 20, 21. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're 14, 15, 16, back in the nineties, we were a little bit more like we had progress a little bit more into the understanding of the world around us. And so like, it wasn't unheard of to hear of two people dating that were like four years apart. Right. Back then, like like a freshman dating a senior, that wasn't like looked down upon. But as we like have moved forward through life, we start to see like power dynamics and development dynamics and For things sure. like that. And you're like, no, that's wrong. Anytime like I had a crush on somebody that was over the age of 18 at a young age, like I was like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I, th I thought I was an adult. I had graduated high school at 16. I was going to the bars when I was 16, like whatever, like totally fully like getting rid of my own childhood, which I do regret um, quite a bit. But like. I look back on that, not like, oh, I was adult enough to have those relationships. I look back on that and I'm like, those people are fucking gross. Right. 
I mean, like I would go on dates, nothing happened because I was a prude, but like my mom always told me, be the one uh, no one's had, not the one everyone can get, um, which if you want to be the one everyone can get, I support you. But <laughs> sexual freedom is also the concept of choosing not to do that. Um, so I never went there with them, but the idea that they were in it for possibly that intention, no matter how nice or great they made me feel or how good of a person I thought they were, mm-hmm. that's gross. It is. That's it- gross. And it's, it goes beyond that, back to, to Wavy, who's in a messed up situation. Her consent, A messed up situation. A methy. A methy. <laughs> so her consent, like her ability to consent is even more compromised. Yeah. Well, I mean, she has, so she has not zero, zero ability to consent because she's a child. Um, and now because of this, like there's negative, like it's like having a bank account and like the, your money in your bank account is like your ability to consent, right? right. She's like $20,000 negative. Right. She's coming at Kellen aggressively. She's Ag- like, should be an indication. She, of like, she's basically like smack me in the face with it. Yeah. Which is an indication. Like I'm talking about his penis, his <laughs> baby arm of a penis. <laughs> baby like, arm holding a baby. baby arm holding a baby arm. <laughs> And that should be a red flag. She's yeah. not only 13, but she's coming. So maybe that is an indication that she's in the negative. So, Bren, we're not judging you. If you hear this, Bren, we're not judging you. We're judging the man. Like, and maybe you should reevaluate it. Girl, we can talk. All Similar right. experiences. So I'm going to ask you this question. Okay. What do you hope readers will take away from this story? And then I'll read you what Bryn wants readers to take away from this story. How to properly pronounce ours. Riedels. <laughs> um... Uh, I, I hope people take away from this, like no matter how much a situation is painted clearly, um, hate to say it, Bryn, but uh, clearly by a victim in a similar situation, you cannot justify the actions based on, um, intention. Intention doesn't always matter. Sometimes wrong is wrong and uh, people's ability to not, um, victim blame, I think is what I want people to see this. I want people to read this book and be like, oh, this is a person that's championing the situation because they've been in it and they're saying it from literally the perspective of Wavy, the right. protagonist, right? Right. Um, but even from that perspective where they're trying to convince you that it's a good thing, like you, it's not hard for you to stay steadfast and no, it's wrong. Right. And that's what I would love for people to take from it. Okay. So Bryn says, above all, I hope... My book makes people think seriously about the nature of consent and a child's right to body sovereignty. So often when we think about sex and we talk about consent, we're just talking about sex alone, but it's not only that. In grappling with the issue of underage sex, people often overlook the fact that everyone was trying to get Wavy to do things. Liam forcing her to eat. Brenda forcing her to stay home, restraining her ability to wander. Keep raising a child. Kellen is the only one who regularly seeks her explicit permission for any kind of physical contact. The question of what rights a child has is incredibly complicated, and there's no easy answers. I hope my readers will think about that. Did you forget about Granny? Granny was the one that paid attention and started counting the food in the house to see, like, okay, well, how she's not eating. Oh, she is eating. She's not eating when I see. So she would count out crackers. To and, know what she and ate. And carefully I, the amount of soup she poured into a, a bowl. Like... And she was the one that went to the teacher and said, no, don't touch her and get her out of this class. She's not special needs. She knows she was the one that figured out that she could write, that she knew her alphabet, that she knew math. Like she was the one that figured that out. Granny got down at one point, like, although Granny's language around that special needs class, she drops the R slur. And I was like, damn, Granny, chill. People drop it about Kellen too. So yeah. And beware reader. And, and this is a message to Bryn. Bryn, the drunken Indian motif, not necessary. Nope. Not necessary. You just, you, you literally played into the hand that this we do, uh, this, this I do have a problem with is you play this drunken Indian motif. Like his mom died of it. Didn't want to be that. Like his dad was it. So he went to his grandmother's and he, he would drink, but he wouldn't drink too much. Cause he didn't want to be a drunken. Indian. Like all the girls talking about how he, he had the look of someone whose mom drank when they were pregnant. Yeah. Like him. trying to call him alcohol, fetal heavy. alcohol. So it's, it's, it's heavy handed the way they like it's, Maybe that's something, and I understand like the uh, the mentality behind the people in that kind of a community. Because, I hate to say it, I've I've you know I've put my foot in that pond a few times. Dip my t- I wouldn't say dip my toes. I fell right the fuck in. But I got out. I got out. <laughs> like, it took a while to get all the moss off me, but I got out. Um, but I remember those people. Like, and I understand like 
that's how those people talk. But you, then you take the straight laced ones and you you make them similar to those that are just bad individuals because of their life choices and some mental health issues that surround substance abuse. Mm-hmm. But like you have someone that's actually caring about this child and you're making them just as vulgar. And I get it's like a timepiece and that's how people were back then. Like I remember being young and people using the R slur and us not thinking twice about it. Mm -hmm. And then as you get older and you start to have compassion, like you start to see that. But like I, I, there was literally no point to drunken Indian being any part of the story. Nope. Other than like maybe once to highlight the racism of the people that he was around, how they didn't respect him fully. Made him an outsider. Yeah. They're like, oh, we can call him down. We can call him stupid. He's just here for the muscle, blah, 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 this and that. He was kind of nonchalant about killing people. He that, was very nonchalant. That about was him. I just, that tells, I think that was a great indicator of his like uh, ethical compass, his moral compass. Yeah. Uh, but like at the end of the day, like maybe I don't like Brent. <laughs> I don't like Brent for other things that are outside of the relationship. Uh, I well, think you, you said it perfectly when I was listing off all the things that she was like, everybody's making wavy do things. Raising a child, raising a child, raising a child. We, and yeah, we Kellen do. was a little bit more receptive, but did he share that information with people that were forcing her to do things? Cause the adult thing to do would be like, Hey, I've noticed like, watch this. Hey, wavy, come here real quick. And she runs right up to him. I just paid attention to what she was doing. Right. Yeah. Like this little girl lives in a life where you don't, you don't own anything. Mm hmm. You can abandon everything at once because she's been pulled out of her home. Nothing belongs to you. Nothing belongs to you. She says it over and over. Even a a, a blanket that she cherished that was from her grandmother, she gave it up without blinking. Mm-hmm. Nothing belongs to you. This is a child that's in pain. The, com- might- the conversation around consent should not be whether or not we need to rethink children's ability to consent, but people's ability to recognize, whoa. Trauma. Negative. Like you said, negative balance. Yeah. Yeah. It's... <sighs> It's ridiculous. I have a I have a niece that's eight. I have a nephew that's eight. Yeah, I have. So I have a I have a I have a niece that's five. I have a niece that's eight. And I have a niece that's thirteen. Yeah. So all the stages of wavy in this book, and I have another one that's in her like twenties now. With it anyway, um, like he has such a hold on her. Like he, there was never um, penetration from his genitals to hers. I feel even uncomfortable talking about the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, he did use fingers, but she and he thought he had broke her hymen when that happened. Mm-hmm. She was just, her, she wasn't even 14 yet because of the time of day she was born, but it was, it was her, her birthday, birthday and she was 14 and child bride, which is very prominent in red States, not just red States, but it's mostly prominent there. We need to talk about that one day. Um, try not to keep this political, but. Oh yeah. He got dad's permission that day. Yep. He'd already, Liam, who was like, yeah, where do I sign? Yeah. Liam's like, I don't fucking care. I hate that kid. Take her. Like, she's a problem. She this, freaks me out. She weirds me out. Normally, I'd have to pay you to take her. You're just taking her willingly. I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. Christ. It's like, dad was ready to throw her away. Mm-hmm. Uncle was, all the men in her life would throw her away. And then here comes, except for one, the one that, the guy that taught her all the constellations. Constellations. Stuff, to help find her way at home. She could always find her way mm-hmm. as long as she knew the uh, constellations. But like, this little girl was very select on who she would let into her life. And the only like women she ever let into her life was Amy. Amy, her grandma, and her her college roommate who she didn't really let into her life, but she was more like she allowed herself into her roommate's life. Right. And that's that's the thing about cautiously w- wavy is like she either will let you in her life, she's reluctant to be in your life, mm-hmm. or she will allow herself to be present in your life. When we talk about like consent in this book and like how Greenwood is trying to like compare it falsely it's a false equivalence to try to compare it to like forcing your child to eat which you shouldn't force your kid to eat but you should try to figure out what's going on the reason why your kid won't eat Mm -hmm. because refusal to eat by children is usually psychological (laughs) start there work your way out yep you know uh keeping her in the home yeah that's protecting her and keeping her safe because she's five she's five and she's sneaking out in the middle of the night i think we are within our rights any any kellen could come along and snatch her up And then where she go? On his motorcycle, which yeah. is practically a whole other character in this book, the way she writes about it. Like, like, he even gets his motorcycle painted to make her happy. He won't allow people to ride on his motorcycle that's a woman because she doesn't want that to happen. She's already, like, and that, possessive of him. That conversation is totally normal. Where the girl said, the lady at the party is like, will you give me a ride on your bike? He's like, sorry, nobody can ride on her. No, no ladies but Wavy can ride on the bike. And everybody's like, oh, bummer. It's like, she's 13. Yeah. Not a single person in this room just went, excuse me? Like, 
What? What? Oh, I mean, they were all snorting meth. True. Uh, substance abuse is a fucking disease. But like in moments of being high, I've sat there and been like, this isn't right. I have to remove myself from this situation. And <laughs> that was as a teenager. Right. You have fully grown adults here that are just like, mm, what of? Her teacher at one point. Yeah. Her teacher, her teacher was there, her like third, fourth grade teacher, some shit like that. Yeah. First grade, I think. I don't know. But like was there and she was going to do a line of coke. She's like, whatever, let's just do it. Because she then, was sad that John Lennon had been shot. Yeah. Girl, get us together. <laughs> Speaking of the teacher, <laughs> did you notice that for the chapters, for those of you that haven't read the book, every chapter is a different character narrating. So we get the perspective of protagonist, antagonist alike. But some of them are in first person narrative and some pers- some of them are in third person. Yeah. And I could, I wrote them down and I cannot make heads or tails as to why Bryn chose the small group to be third person narrative to save my life. So, the which group? So, all the chapters that are written from I, uh-huh. I went, you know, okay, so first person. That's the repetitive characters. Th- those are. All the I language no, comes from like the repetitive characters. The court reporter, the judge. Spoke from I? I. The court reporter who her one chapter serves to basically give us like a impartial. Which view. you would think the court reporter. Is I. Would speak from a third person point of view. So the third person is um, her teacher. That was a one-off for D- the most part. D. D you see quite a bit though. Mm-hmm. The two nurses that take care of Val when, and when she gets hurt. The day nurse and the night nurse. The, which I want to talk about that scene in a right. minute. Cause... And Mrs. Humphreys. Those five are the only ones. Court reporter, Renee the roommate, Butch, Kellen, Wavy, Grandma. Uh, there's even a chapter, Kutchian, is that how you pronounce Kutchin. it? Kutchin. Kutchin. His is first person, Donald. Like, I feel like she took some last names and just finagled them into. I thought I, I thought I had my finger on the theory and then the court reporter. Well, maybe, okay, writing from the court reporter in first person rather than third person is a way to like slide the idea that the court reporter is like whole position is to write in third person. So putting in a first person narrative, I think that makes a little bit more sense. As far as the judge, the judge wasn't really spoken of in the the story because when you say D, D didn't really have a huge portion, part in the story. Mm-hmm. She was more of like an object right? Uh, to kind of highlight the behavior of Liam. Hmm. So uh, those that did have more of an important role, like the judge was the one that put him away. The judge remembered the whole story, this, that, and the other thing. And then she starts communicating to the judge before you even hear from the judge. And then she sits down with the judge and then the judge comes back. Like the judge has a reoccurring role in the story and has a, 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 the role is an imperative in the story. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be why she put the judge in first person. Sherry and Grant also had a first person chapter. Who's Sherry and Grant again? Grant is one of Butch, Grant... Oh, okay, all okay. those guys. But again, who the hell is like, they all had one chapter. But then again, like D, D was written in third person, first person, third person, third person. Mm-hmm. And Grant was written in first person In first person who was all written in third person again. Okay. The teacher, the John Lennon woman, D woman, Patty, the nurse woman, Casey, the nurse woman, Miss Humphreys woman. Hmm. I think that through her experiences, she's uh, started to take away agency from women and creates them as an object to highlight the behavior of other people. Oh, I think you're right. The only women who have a first person are Amy. Leslie never gets one. No. But Amy needs one. Grandma gets one. Amy actually speaks for Leslie. Brenda never has one. Val never has one. But also in the same sense, um, first person, there's an importance to them Mm -hmm. to Wavy. Renee, she has one. To your point, so I, it was about halfway through that I realized this. I don't. So I don't I think Brent intentionally the- made women objects, but I think that uh, if she grew up in a similar situation of like seeing how like her father mm-hmm. Liam, the father in the story, treated women and used women to highlight himself mm-hmm. and to make him it highlights who he is as a character. Right to have multiple girlfriends, they know of each other. His wife knows of the girlfriends. His wife is kept away from them. When she comes around, she's like, "I can make you disappear. Like I can make him dump you tomorrow." Right. Like she's like understanding what his situation is. She hates him but loves him at the same time. Like I think that whole uh, concept of women being objects to highlight the the actions of men, mm-hmm. and then she when she puts women in uh, first person. It's using them to highlight uh, the actions of Wavy. I think you're right. I was about, but what made me think of it was the John Lennon chapter, where we're reading it from the teacher perspective. We're about halfway through it, and I'm like, why? Why is this in third person? So I flipped back to the beginning, and I made a note of like third, third. It, it was interesting. So I think you're right, though. Yeah, like that. See, this is how lit majors talk about books. 
<laughs> yeah. we're Did gonna, you notice this? We're getting in the nitty gritty. Yeah. Um, it's going to take me a, a minute to like swing back into fucking label. You should see um, the book thief. Like you think you got a lot of tabs there. <laughs> like this thing is mangled. Yeah. Like I'm mangled. It's got tabs. It's annotated. <laughs> it's underlined, Highlighted. dog-eared, torn. Like it is mangled. Oh, that's weird. You're wearing like Mother of Dragons today. I am. It's got all my kids' names on it too. I wanted to ask, where were you, where was your head at? At the car accident, Kellen tripping over Donald's body. Who was he survived it? Obviously, because he's in the end of the book. But I stopped and I texted you. Donald is becoming the hardest part of this book for me. Okay, that's where I that's thought. Where that's where I, I thought was. that. Came I texted from. you. I was like, Donald is pulling at my heartstrings, and I, he he was hard to. That was hard for me. Let me put some of this book into perspective for you guys. I would text her. Uh, she's like, okay, flying. So like, I'm hoping this doesn't happen. Um, and I'm like, <laughs> wait till you hit 221 stretch. That was the couch. Uh, yeah well uh, like yeah. that was what we were dreading happening the entire like read up to that point yeah and then it happened and I, she's like oh i'm just like you you have this back and forth like oh he's like really fighting with this like he's struggling it gives you an idea of like oh he can't really help this but he is helping it and um you need to be able to get, like you can't help how you feel but you can control how you right. act on those feelings and you see this like struggle with him and you're like okay well like he's also had a fucked up life too so maybe his moral compass is off. well it's clear his moral compass is off but still like there are certain lines that you don't cross right. and like even in prison when they find out that you are in there for this situation Mm-hmm. Like they come after you. But going back to your question about Donald. Yeah. And that's when I texted you. I'm like, this is getting really hard. But Butch's chapter, and probably why I like Butch so much, is because he talks about how he's the first person to use the word pedophile. Yep. He's also the one that gives us a lot of backstory into her life. Do you remember this? He's talking about when uh, Val was on the playground with Wavy and grabbed her and shook her. Donald? No, Wavy. Oh, no, Donald is talking about this? Yeah, Butch is talking about this. Oh, Butch, Liam and I go way back, and I owed him for keeping my name out of And he's like, hey, how about just don't shake her? Yeah, but watching Val rattle that little kid's brain around was a line in the sand for me. Yeah. So, like, I mean. (sighs) There are a lot of those little moments, and I was like, oh, I don't know if I can finish this. (laughs) <laughs> but a lot of these characters too, like it also speaks to the danger that uh, Liam was mm-hmm. because like Kellen could probably have easily smash Liam in half. Like, mm-hmm. and he would take a punch. He knew that he was going to get hit by Liam and he would take the punch. Yeah. He'd be like, are you done? Okay. Now let's move on. Like, so I see, I understand other people like being afraid of Liam, but like, I'm sorry. Was it just me? Or like, I kept picturing like a drugged out, like cracked out Iggy pop. Yeah. What I was thinking of when they Liam? described Liam. Yeah. There's a, a scene in here uh, with Wavy. And this is like the where you're seeing the relationship like start to turn. This is about 20, 20 pages exactly before the sex scene. Okay. Right. Um, it's when uh, Jimmy Didier asked her to the dance. And he goes, he wrote her a letter. Dear Wavy, I like you a lot. Will you go to the eighth grade dance with me? Um, she's eighth grade. Right. Uh, you don't have, which is. 13, 14 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, it is right before her birthday. You don't have to talk to me if you don't want to. Do you even like me a little Jimmy Didier? She answered him on his own note with her fancy handwriting. Jimmy, not even a little. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> absolutely the fuck not. And uh, I think my fiance would be very angry to find out you're writing me notes like this. Please don't do it again. Miss Wavona Quinn. Right. And then on the next page, uh, this is Kellen. Because Kellen's like, oh, like he's, I, it was sad, but funny. Sad that the boy got his heart broken, wadded up the note and threw it back at her. Funny how Wavy answered him. Funnier how she showed it to me. Not bragging, but embarrassed. I broke the rule. The rule. The rule of not telling people about their situation, right? Like he was waiting to end up in jail. Yeah. And then he goes, I like seeing the ring on Wavy's finger. It gave me an excuse to kiss her hand. And when I did, she always smiled. That's what I was doing while we watched TV, kissing her hand and petting her hair. Um, the way she liked when I heard footsteps creeping up on the stairs, my first thought was to get off the bed and quick before the nurse got to the top of the stairs, except I wasn't doing nothing wrong. First of all, that's a double negative. That means you were, um, it was a Freudian slip and a half. If <laughs> you ask me. Anyway, we were just watching TV. If Patty wanted to spy on us, that's what she'd see. And I underlined that whole, whole section. And right next to it says like full on grooming mm-hmm. that that's full on grooming. And to her, she's having this intimate moment. Um, 
And then he starts bargaining with himself two pages later. She grinned, and before she sank back under the water, I saw something I wish I hadn't. With her undershirt plastered to her, this is where he like is really They're noticing swimming. her body as yeah. naked. Um, with her undershirt plastered to her, there was no way to avoid knowing that she had tits now. I felt like an idiot for being shocked because she was growing up and not just taller. And I wrote next to it, he's bargaining with himself. Mm-hmm. It's fucking weird. It's and then like poor Donald is in this and he's like get in we're butt naked like <laughs> poor why Donald. not because Wavy's my not my sister I said well she doesn't care oh, I was like I don't like it, it's he's like I do like so you see him like he knows what this is wrong like through it like they're like I don't know if Bryn meant this but like or maybe like she meant it as in like oh they're overcoming the social boundaries that would uh that are put in place to protect children mm-hmm. and he's like. He's he's calling himself out. He knows it's wrong. Right. But the, what gets me is when the sheriff is like, it's important to like, tell me, did you penetrate her or not? Because if you didn't, and it, oh, well, it seems like she was kind of willing, everybody. Like this this language around she wanted it. It's because yeah. she was taught to want it. Right. She was infatuated from him from the moment they met. And at no point, like to your, you said this earlier, nobody was like, by the way, this is illegal. This yeah, is, this is these laws are in place so that when a child like Wavy encounters somebody like him who cannot stop himself, that's why the law exists. Had had like they've been separated from like the moment, like instead of him coming back to try to see if she was real, right? Like, had they been separated from that moment, years later, she would have been like that. Would have been a whisper of a memory in her brain. Yep, she would have moved on quick. She has other things to worry about with, with how much she had to worry about, like how much she had to fear. Like he appeared to her as like the one good thing mm-hmm. and it was still bad. It mm-hmm. was unhealthy at best, but compared to everything else that was going on around her, she's like, well, this is normalcy. Right. I mean, follow that train of thought. If he hadn't come back after the accident to see if she was real, um, fucking weirdo, she would have powered through, kept on doing the, the best she could with Donald until <laughs> Liam and Val inevitably met that fate and they would have gone to Brenda's. What would her life have been if this guy, to your point, could have just, he can admit to himself that it's wrong, but, not, Donald, but not enough to not do it. What was his name? Sean coming along and be like, oh, Donald's my kid. Yeah. Once again, Brenda being like, well, I guess we have to let him go. Do you? Do you? I feel like any judge would be like, hmm, Brenda, Sean, let me hear your case. <laughs> like, stand up and fight. Yeah. It, 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 it fucking it blows my mind. I, I rage read pages. By of the way, book. guys, like through a lot of this book, <laughs> Tunnel and um and Wavy are like kind of an age, not age difference, but like they both take on ages that Candace has kids for. Yep. Like Candace has kids that are like a, a daughter that's older than the little brother. Like I can't imagine how this was reading for you. Like I kept like, I there a, were so many times in the book that I was like, oh fuck, I hope Candace is okay reading this. There, I, I have a three-year-old little boy. This was hard. Yeah. There, there were parts that, and I have a daughter and I don't care what age your daughter is. I mean, I mean, I would think that if any dude like Callan hit on her, she'd pull a switchblade out of somewhere <laughs> and just shank the shit out. I call her Shawshank for a reason. If ever I wanted to teach her that shit, I definitely do now. Yeah. <laughs> I got a switchblade she can have. Full. It's illegal, but I mean, I don't see her really caring about that. No. <laughs> She's like, watch how I can throw it. <laughs> She's going to add it to her collection. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure she has sharp objects hidden somewhere. Like, I, I, I know not to cross her. Good. And I'm from Long Beach. Like, I'm not afraid of anybody. This one makes me a little nervous. I feel like she's got some fire starter tendencies. Like, Drew Barrymore, full rager. Like You're like, I'm not afraid of her. I'm just aware. Like, I don't trust her with scissors an attitude and my hair. <laughs> like, I will be aware of where she's at at all times when she's upset with me. Yeah, but you love her just enough that I don't want you to babysit because I'm afraid of what the two of you would do <laughs> if you became a team. <laughs> yeah. I give her a look and she's like, I'm on it. I'm like, on what? I'm like, don't worry. Just watch. Just look. <laughs> all right. After everything you've just heard us talk about this story and the character arc, if you can call it that, um, a beautiful and provocative love story between two unlikely people and the hard one relationship, so on and so forth. It's not beautiful. If you read the reviews, it's cut between two people, people who read that and thought that's what they were getting, or people like us who were like, this, no. this, <laughs> this sounds like a runaway train. This is an absolute fuck no. But talk about the power of the the synopsis and like the... All of Bryn's reviews that are horrible are people who read that and were like, oh, 
I want to read a provocative, beautiful love story. And they actually have a moral compass and they're like, holy and they're shit, like, wait a minute. This is pedophilia and grooming and like, yeah. I was reading this, like this is, I can almost call it a nail biter. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it's not, oh, what's going to happen next? It's like, please don't let this happen. Oh God, it happened. Yeah. Uh, oh, and it was graphic. Yeah. It's like when you're rolling up on that car accident and you're like, oh, don't be too, don't be And bad. you see an arm in the middle of the road and you go bump, bump. And you're like, oh, sh- I just ran <sighs> over somebody's arm. I hope there's not a head in the middle of the road. And you're like, you're like, oh, that's, <laughs> nope. <laughs> like, so for those that don't like the sound of gagging or her dry heaving, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't have a soundboard, so I'm, I am, I'm like, I'm like that dude in a uh, police academy that makes helicopter noises. <laughs> just like gross bodily functions. Okay. I think we should let people name this last segment because I think we should do it for a lot of our books. Okay. Okay. So I have some questions for you to wrap up this book. By the way, you guys, um, I will put on probably both Twitter and Instagram. Look in the description for all that information. Tell us what you should name this segment. Because I think there are three good questions we should ask for every book. Yes. So tell us what you think this segment should be called. All right. First question. Who would you buy this book for? If um, all of our readers are Barnes and Noble and they see this on the shelf. Who is this a gift for? Oh God. Um, <laughs> an enemy, like a friend of me and be like, Oh, what'd you think of the book? And they're like, Oh, it was great. And be like, you're a fucking pervert. <laughs> you are like, you need to be locked up. I think you should give it to the person who you've gifted books to in the past and you suspect they didn't read it. Oh yeah. Because they're going to read, they're uh, going to read the, the synopsis. beautiful pr- provocative <laughs> Love story, and they're like, it was a great love story. You're gonna be like, I caught you. Mm. Caught. Segment question number two. Okay. What are your questions for the book club that meets to talk about this? Oh, that's if a you've good ch- one. If you've chosen this for your book club, dear readers, here's what we think when you guys meet for mimosas <laughs> and coffee. This is our list of questions. I would say, um, first and foremost, go with coffee because. Mm, you're loosened up by the alcohol a little bit. You might agree to things that you normally wouldn't agree to. And everyone's going to remember that, especially Karen. And she's going to put it on her Facebook group and everyone's going to know. Yeah. And then your stylist is going to find out. And they're like, I won't tell a soul. And then they tell everybody. I'm not one of those stylists. Wink. Anyway. Okay. So what questions would I want you guys uh, to look at? I really want I would I want you guys to explore the ideas of symbolism. We didn't really get into symbolism. Swimming was a big deal. Yeah. Swimming was a big deal. Anytime there's like um water involved with like the protagonist going into the water and coming out, like it it's represents a form of rebirth. So it's like a shift in their personality. Uh usually like when she goes in the water with her brother, mm-hmm. now he notices she has breasts. Mm-hmm. Like it's a, another development of her life. So um we didn't really go over too much when it comes to uh, symbolism because, I mean, no offense to Brynn, but there wasn't a lot of symbolism here. It was like straight to the point. Right. Constellation. I think, the I constellations think were. That's another one. For her to find her way home and no matter how much uh, she knew how to do that, she was she was always lost. She stayed lost. Right. Her, she was lost through the entire thing. So I think exploring symbolisms and uh, for those uh, symbolisms. It's not an embolism. Anyway, uh, for the symbol, uh, symbolism of it, like uh, the symbology. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, it's a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, get the, the Herder, H-E-R-D-E-R, Dictionary of Symbols. I had one on deck just in my house. <laughs> Candace had one on deck in her house. It's like, it's like a go-to book for every lit major. It, it, like... You're not going to find everything that you think is a symbol. You're not going to find in there. Remember yonic or phallic symbols or anything that are pole like (laughs) yonic symbols or anything that are internal, uh, like caves, water. The yonic is the feminine symbol. The uh, phallic symbol is the more masculine symbol Mm -hmm. uh, and how they relate to the story. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a good one. And I think that's a good conversation. Yeah. And like. Look at how I think I want you guys to explore the possibility, not the possibility, but explore how Brian Greenwood writes the female, the women characters in the story, Mm -hmm. how some of them are used as objects to present the behavior of the men in the story. Yeah. And then others are um, written as objects for uh, wavy to describe wavy as a character. And I think wavy Wavy has an ownership. Wavy has an ownership over everybody around her. Mm-hmm. 
She has learned to manipulate situations where people are worried about how she's going to react, what she's going to do, how she's going to do it um, in the way that her father is thought of. Mm -hmm. People are scared of how he's going to react, what he's going to do, how he's going to do it. Um, And so, and her father shows like, what's the term I'm looking for? Like sexual, improper sexual behavior, Mm -hmm. I guess. I mean, everyone's consenting adults with him Mm -hmm. in in a sense, but they're also afraid of him. Like, so I think like that translates into her. She knows him to be a bad guy, but she like. Leverages the volatile nature right yeah. like she she does what he does which is she's a product. i know you think i'm crazy so i'm going to use that she's very much a product of her parents yep very much a product of her parents she's got um uh, she's neurotic by proxy mm-hmm. she's like uh like she, the constant fear of her fear. and i wonder i want to know like another question is how did her behavior change knowing that um the the fear of good mom bad mama and yeah. say his name and don't like call him daddy. Don't call him daddy. Mm. How, how she changed once they were dead. Yeah. Because their death represents a rebirth for her represents a rebirth for Donald pre death, post death for both of those kids. Yeah. Um, I think a good question for your book club is secrets. Secrecy is a motif through the whole thing. Yeah. And it's interesting to look how Amy relates to that. She keeps wavy secret because she thinks it's, something cool between the two of them. Yeah. But she doesn't keep secrets where she's like, no, it's exclusive is what it is. It is. And all the way to her girlfriend. At the Cause end. Every, everyone's trying to access. Everyone tries to access uh wavy wavy. And because she has some of that access that becomes exclusive and that makes her feel cooler than the people around her. Right. And how she is with her mom. She's I so mean, fucking shallow. I mean, I don't want to guide the conversation too much because I think it's fun for people to talk about. But if you like look at the like a linear motif of secrecy, the way wavy or uh, not wavy, but Amy just sort of her relationship undulates through it through her relationship to secrecy is just fascinating. And so like she even gets pissed at Leslie for doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. So like if Leslie could have kept her big mouth shut, like that's how she like that's her whole attitude towards it. And at the end of the book, they're at Christmas and the girl says, I'm Amy's roommate. And Amy's mad that that's how she introduced her and corrects herself mid party. Like, I mean, because there's no more secrets. There's no more secrets. And she's like, actually, that's my girlfriend. Like, Amy's relationship. Well, she's to like, secrecy. she's like, oh, this is a pedophile situation. I don't think a lesbian issue is going to be that much of a problem at this point. But like, everybody's consistent in Brenda is like on the north side and then shifts and then she's on the south side. But like, yeah. people relate to the motif of secrecy very, like, predictably except for amy okay I so think, i honestly I, I feel like um you know the little symbol for shuffle mm-hmm. on um like music like yeah, the, any, the arrow. it has the arrows that like x each other i feel like everybody is on starts off on on one line of that that symbol and they both sh- like you shift south or you shift north on like where you sit uh, where the character sits on the topic and like i think to to further expand on her question is uh, how, in what ways do all the characters um, as we pull to the end, even Donald, because Donald there's, there's a, there's a air of mystery around Donald almost as if she could write a second book from Donald's perspective Mm -hmm. or Donald after the fact, Um, Bryn leave that child alone. Yeah, please don't. He's perfect. Well, not really, but like he could have been, but look at how, once the cat's out of the bag and the secret is no longer a secret and it's being forced in everybody's face, how all the other characters, how their secrecy changes. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I mean, you gave a perfect example with Amy. Right. But like, look at Leslie and look at. Um, and the language they all use. Yeah. Like wavy sneaking out and like wavy secrets. Amy calls them games. Games. Yeah. You know, and mom is very much the. Like you said before, we don't talk about that. When she pulls over the car, she turns around and she's like, how can you guys keep this a secret? Like, yeah. she like, whoa, there's, there's a hot button word, mom. Like, I mean, if Amy even sort of They're reacts, lucky they didn't get backhanded for Amy keeping that secret. Amy even reacts, like, reading between the lines, Amy's like, I thought that's how we be. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> uh, mom, snitches so, get stitches. Anyway. And this is wavy. She probably would give us, like. <laughs> a lot of. <laughs> like, she was raised on a meth camp, mom. <laughs> So yeah, secrets and and all of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Third question. Okay. Last one. Which actors would you cast to play all these characters? Mm. 
I don't know who I'd cast to play a young Wavy, but I do know that I would put Numi Price as older Wavy. She played um, uh, Lizbeth Salander in the Swedish films. Yes. Of, oh. um, Girl okay. with the Dragon Tattoo. Uh, she's played on a lot of things since. I think she was on FBI, that one, uh, where, where she wakes up with all the tattoos and they all have oh, that yeah. TV show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which I was really into it. And then, like, season four, I'm like, oh, it took a fucking turn. I only saw the first season. Uh, so it, was, it was good up until the fourth season. Uh, but, like, I think Numi Price would be good at playing um, her. Uh, I think, I mean, Iggy Pop has done some work. Um, <laughs> it doesn't have to be realistic. I mean, It we- doesn't. I'm trying to think of who would play Liam really well. Oh, Liam Schreiber might. No. Or does he have his little brother? His little brother, um, who was uh, he played? Uh, did you watch SVU? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember like the serial guy that ends up getting Mariska Hargitay and yeah. she like kills him or whatever in yeah. the end? And he like had like burned his hands and stuff. That's Liam Schreiber's little brother. He would do good. Like he would yeah. be really well as uh, Liam in the character. He, he would bring that to life. Um, you know who's gained some weight? And I'm not body shaming here, but uh, he's he he played Jacob. In uh, in Twilight, I think he could play Kellen. You think he's kind of a goob, so it makes sense. I don't think he's tall enough, though. I think he's only like five nine. Um, who would play a good? Oh, you know who play a good Kellen? <laughs> Have you ever seen Trailer Park Boys? No. Oh, Ricky, not Ricky. Uh, yeah, is it Ricky? No, Ricky isn't. Hold on. Um, but yeah, so who would play Val really well? Heather Graham. I think Heather Graham could play like a good Val. Um. Brenda, who do I see for Brenda? Helen Hunt. Yeah. I could put Helen Hunt in um, Brenda's position. Yeah. Because uh, Brenda's one where you have to be somebody who can pull off the, the likable and the unlikable. Or, you know, Connie, what's her name? She was in American Horror Story. She was Connie Britton. Yeah. She would play a good she Brenda. She would be a good Brenda. She'd be a really good Brenda. Um, yeah. So I was going to look up the character. He's the one that always has a cocktail in his hand in uh, Trailer Park Boys. Well, Kellen's I, a hard one to cast Kellen. because it's like who could pull off the, not just the look, but yeah. that like. Well, I mean, it's a pretty generic look. It's I, I picture him wearing a black shirt with black hair that's kind of brushed out of his face, biker look to him, right. but like clean shaven, not like bearded or anything like that. Um, dark eyes, kind of tag. I feel like he would have a barbed wire tattoo somewhere. Yeah. But he has to be able to play it to where like that everything that we've talked about where it's yeah. like just a hair in the wrong direction and it's too predatory. Like, I'm sorry, but like whoever plays Kellen, if they pull it off, that's, that's going to get an Academy Award. Yeah. I don't think there's any For plans. For all the wrong reasons, but it's going to get the Academy Award. Just rest assured, everybody, I don't think there's any plans for this to be. It better not be. I mean, <laughs> I don't I'm not going to censor it, but I'm just going to be like, I, I'll probably actually watch it. I just <laughs> want to make sure the scenes aren't the scenes. Mm. Like, Young adult novel, that bitch, like where you whisper the idea of it. Cause someone is going to have to play a 13 year old. That's 18 in any guard. But even then that's an 18 year old fresh right. playing a 13. Like, yeah, don't worry anybody. I, I, yeah, I don't think from what I've read, I don't, I don't think you have to worry about this one. coming. Who's going to green light that project? Exactly. <laughs> this book was a fucking ride, dude. Like the whole time, like literally it, it takes, it, it took everything for me and Candace not to, Talk about it all. Not week? to talk about it. We would just every now and then she would get a voice memo from me going, "Oh God." <laughs> I think I sent you probably. And I'm like, "What page are you on?" She tell me. I'm like, <laughs> I sent "Buckle you the, in." The same text at least half a dozen times. What the fuck is this book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I wanted to. I was hoping <sighs> to go into this just to be fucking roasting the shit out of Candace, and I'm like, "Mama Bear's heartstrings are being tugged on." <laughs> I mean, I was shocked to find out there was a heart with strings of tug, but like, fair, you know, fair. Like, I, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> like, shit. But we came out the gate with this first book. I mean, we did not start easy. Like, it was, yeah, <laughs> we went from zero. Oh, and, and zero by the way, guys, the books are kind of ordered in um, from least to most shocking for the month. And like, this is not the worst of them all. Mm-mm-mm. Like uh, the third one, Misery, uh, many of you may have seen the movie. Please read the book because books always give you insight of inner monologue. And that's why when people are like, oh, the book's way better than the movie. It's because people can't act out inner monologue. Notoriously with Stephen King. Yeah. 
Um, because all his all his books are great, but his movies have like a camp factor to them. Like they're they're almost so bad they're good. It's the high production value of them that you're like, hmm, this takes a little bit away from the novel. So yeah, Bryn, I was like, mm, who hurt you? But now we know. Uh, second, um. I know you, you think that you're like speaking up for all the underage and overage relationships out there because you had them, but like look back on your life. Yeah, you're a victim, sweetheart. Yeah, like it's it's time. Like you need help. This this was a this cry is for Stockholm help. syndrome. Yeah, this was this a cry like a, for help. Please, please, everybody, agree with me that this is normal. No, no, sweetheart. Like my heart goes out to you in the best and biggest way, but like this is like ext- This is Stockholm syndrome. Mm-hmm. This this book is Stockholm syndrome. It's grooming. <sighs> enjoy it everybody yeah it's it's rough <laughs> please, please tag us when you post a picture of your face when you finish <laughs> i want selfies of everybody just yes, like please with the like shock on instagram tag us i want to, i want all your book club but make sure you have your book in the in the image so that way when people scroll through the tagged images they can see the re- the visual response yes. even even if you have videos where you're like what the fuck we want all your book club photos all of them <laughs> all of them <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed it. Next week on the 19th, we will be discussing Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. Uh, I want to make it very clear to people because I know a lot of people don't like to read or they have an inability to read, like to sit still for that long. They don't have the attention span or dyslexia. Uh, listening to Audible is definitely reading. And if Absolutely. anybody like tries to sit there and argue with you otherwise, you heard the same story the way they fucking read it. Yep. You can discuss it the same way anybody who read it in word paperback, for word. hardback, e-reader it does not matter if you've consumed the material you've read the book in my opinion yes and when even in book clubs if a book club says no you can't listen to the book that's they're arguing over the charcuterie board Mm -hmm. like trust me the quiet one does the best one she's just not going to show everybody because she's sick and tired of the arguments if you're in a book club that says that i i encourage you to do let us be your book club do the audiobook for three or four meetings and Hold your own just to prove the fucking point. <laughs> yeah, don't even tell them. Don't tell them. Just be like, and just show how. And well- when they're like, "Oh my god, you're so invested," you're gonna be like, "Yeah, because I listened to the book, mm. you dicks." Yeah, can't even listen to each other, assholes. Like, just call them every name in the book. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, guys, thank you for uh, joining in with us. So t- today is the 12th. We're discussing All the Ugly and Wonderful Things by Bryn Greenwood. Next week on the 19th, we are going to be reading Geek Love by Catherine Dunn. And then on the 26th, uh, we will be lis- listening to reading, uh, discussing, discussing Misery. Misery by Stephen King. Look at me talking about how I remember things. Yeah. <laughs> TBD on March's reading list. We'll try to get those out as soon as possible so everybody has a chance we to will, get the We book. will discuss uh, the March reading list on the 26th. Um, we will be posting it on Instagram. We'll post it on uh, Twitter. Look in the description of this to see what the, the handles are. They should mm-hmm. be pretty uniform and pretty good about making sure that happens. Uh, Just like February, we'll give you all three at once. Yes. Anyways, guys, tune in with us. Uh, Next week to talk about carnies biting off the heads of chicken and uh, experimenting with drugs to have deformed babies. I can't wait for that one. That's what you're in for. Yeah. So tune in next week for carnies and meth. All right. See you then. uh, Radio Isotopes. (laughs) Have a good one, guys. We're out. Today is the 12th. 9th. 12th? What is it? 9th. It's the 9th today, I think, right? 12th. 9th is Wednesday. Okay, yeah, the 12th. So um, I know how to read a calendar. I just didn't look at it. Um, and I felt like it was gaslighting me anyway. It's like you're turning 37. I'm like, I don't appreciate that. The 9th is when I'm getting my hair done. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I'm dreading that day. Yep, you're um, stuck with me a second time this week. And I have I have another uh, uh, mutual sister coming in halfway through it, but I'll make it work. Um, if your hair falls out, you wanted a pixie anyway. Um, or I'll convince you at least. This, this was like, the plan the whole time. Chemical cuts are the new hair I cuts. take it back. For nine months, I've been telling you, you can't pull off the mohawk. But today, mm, I feel like we can do it. I usually joke when I tell people purple mohawk, but we're halfway there. So let's just <laughs> fucking burn it off. Full send. <laughs>